James Bond is occasionally accused of being a psychopath. Not that he would care. The charge sheet against him is pretty heavy, at least if we are using conventional psychology to assess what passes for James Bond's inner life. For sure, on the hair psychopathy test, which is the gold standard measure for assessing dangerous personality disorders, Bond ticks a lot of boxes. James Bond has a glib, superficial charm, and he lies artfully whenever necessary. His affect, the way he comes across, is generally flat. He is immune to anxiety, but he has difficulty relaxing, and he is impulsive, prone to risky behaviour and easily bored. Bond rarely shows any remorse, and he is often callous. He is also what psychologists call highly disagreeable, and he is a versatile criminal who indulges in everything from lockpicking to multiple murder. He is irresponsible, particularly with his own life, and he is so promiscuous that it's a wonder why we never see him visit an STD clinic. The list of James Bond's psychological flaws could fill a book, and frequently does. So why do audiences warm to this cold fish? Well, I believe that James Bond's appeal owes a lot to his creator's brilliant and probably conscious decision to split what we might call the positive and negative aspects of psychopathy. Ian Fleming, the author of the original Bond novels, imbues Bond with the aspects of psychopathy that make him a successful spy, what we might call the pro-social aspect. But he hives off all of the crazier attributes of psychopathy onto the villains. In Bond's mad world, it's the supervillains, and not Bond himself, that exhibit the grandiosity, the malice, and the unbridled lust for power that are present in all psychopaths. So, if anything, Bond is a successful, high-functioning psychopath. But is there more to him? Does he have a heart? More importantly, does he have a value system which would set him apart from most psychopaths in the real world? For such a superficial character, the answers to these questions are surprisingly complex. Some of the blame for Bond's superficiality lies not in his personality type, but in his origins within a particular literary tradition. Bond is the heir to the imperial, daring do, boy's own style of the George Henty novels, or earlier spy novels such as John Buchan's The 39 Steps. In these novels, the stiff upper lipped hero doggedly sees off unsavoury foreigners and their treasonous plots. All that might seem old fashioned, but that's because Bond was built to last. Politically, James Bond appeals to conservatives. In this scene from Goldfinger, Bond is positioned very much against the 1960s counterculture. I'm over temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. Bond's conservatism is rather surprising, as he is a libertine, and he fully enjoys the consumerism and flashiness that defined the 1960s. But you have to remember that Bond was always a commercial enterprise, both for his creator, who churned out at least one Bond novel every year, and for Cubby Broccoli, who produced many of the earlier Bond films. But Bond is more than a Cold War conservative. His value system is instinctive, not ideological, and his beliefs extend far beyond old ideas like duty and patriotism. Ian Fleming had first-hand experience of the Soviet Union as early as the 1930s, and he realised the nature of the communist threat very quickly. I think that Fleming perceived a relationship between psychopathy and Marxism, and worked this theme into his novels, where many of the villains are Soviet puppets. For the supervillain, the grandiose ends always justify the murderous means. But in typical British fashion, Bond's propensity for murder is above board and properly licensed. The propaganda value of James Bond as the implacable adversary of communism was well understood by the Russians, who were sufficiently upset as to churn out their own East versus West spy propaganda in much the same vein. In Ian Fleming's novels, though, 
Bond is originally drawn into the battle against Smirsh, a fictional version of the KGB, out of revenge over the death of his lover, Vesper Lind. For Bond, and ironically for Marxists too, the personal is political. In the films, Spectre, an international terrorist organisation with its origins in Soviet communism, gets the starring role as the evil organisation against which Bond must do battle. Yet despite his obvious loathing of communism, it's hard to believe that Bond's opposition to collectivist ideologies of all kinds is very well thought out. As an incorrigible snob, Bond mainly despises communism for its utter lack of style. In the film of From Russia With Love, one of the slip-ups that alerts Bond to the fact that his fellow diner, Red Grant, is a KGB agent, is that the chap drinks red wine with fish. For Bond, this is an unforgivable crime. Seen through a political lens, the earlier Bond films are a sort of travelogue of real-life Soviet subversion, from corrupt trade unions in Casino Royale to the 1960s black power movement in Live and Let Die. On the other side of the political horseshoe, the double murder that kicks off the plot in the novel of For Your Eyes Only is carried out by a former Gestapo officer working for Cuban communists. So for Fleming, all totalitarian ideologies are comparably malicious. Of course, all the minor villains and henchmen pale into insignificance next to the master psychopath and main antagonist of the Bond novels, Ernst Stavlo Blofeld. In the 2015 film Spectre, it is revealed that Blofeld shares Bond's origin story, but his life story has been the mirror image of Bond's. Like both Fleming and Bond, Blofeld was exposed to the thin air and rarefied intellectualism of the Austrian Tyrol as a younger man. But Blofeld has drawn the opposite lessons from Bond, who likes skiing, but Nietzsche not so much. Bond instinctively despises Blofeld's personal inadequacy, his physical weakness, his lack of style, and above all, his pseudo-intellectualism. These middle European ideas are satirised in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, where a health clinic in the Alps is a front for brainwashing terrorists. And it's been echoed again more recently in Spectre, where Bond visits another clinic purporting to offer clean air and therapy for stressed executives who enjoy drinking fruit juice. Bond, a self-actualised ubermensch, largely held together by martinis and languid sex, is as bored by ideas as he is by almost everything else. From his perspective, the quintessentially English distrust of highfalutin ideas is virtuous. Of course, this is not just good old-fashioned philistinism. Bond's real enemy is the nihilism under the surface of all ideologies. For all his faults, Bond is not a miserableist. In one famous scene from Moonraker, the defeated villain reveals the underlying ideological malaise behind his grandiose dreams. At least I shall have the pleasure of putting you out of my misery. So there is good and evil, and a kind of ethics, in the Bond universe. We might take this a step further and ask, is James Bond the unlikely agent of divine vengeance? In this scene from Goldeneye, Bond uses the cliché phrase, the writing's on the wall. This is apparently a glib reference to the biblical story of Belshazzar's feast. According to the biblical story, a mysterious hand prophesies the fall of Belshazzar's empire as punishment for his disobedience to God. Bond's throwaway line foreshadows not only the fall of the Yanis crime syndicate, which Bond will cause, but also he casts Bond as the agent of divine retribution. Like all good movie heroes, Bond goes through cycles of deaths, resurrections and reinventions, and journeys through the underworld, while remaining resolutely unholy. So what are the origins of Bond's apparent psychopathic traits? We know that Bond is an orphan, but this early trauma is a very common literary trope. See Harry Potter for comparison, if you must. And this tragic backstory allows the reader to more easily identify with the hero, mainly through psychological projection. 
Unfortunately, scans of James Bond's brain are not available, and details of his childhood are left intentionally vague, so we cannot know if he meets a clinical diagnosis of psychopathy. But the truth is that it doesn't really matter. Bond is unique among fictional heroes in that he never really changes. This unchangeability is, of course, a trait that all psychopaths have in common. But the Bond universe necessarily breaks all of the rules of the hero's journey. Through all Bond's suffering and misadventures, no great psychological insight is gained and no traumas are resolved, unless with violence. After all, there's nothing to learn if you're always the best. As James Bond is a complete bastard, he could be accused of having poor object relations. This is a psychological term exploring how some individuals relate to others simply as the manifestations of their ideas or as a means to meet their inner desires. Psychopaths are known for their poor object relations, notably in their callousness towards their lovers. Where women are concerned, you might say that James Bond has great game. Quite literally. According to the Italian writer and cultural critic Umberto Eco, women in Bond novels are simply pieces in the same endlessly recurring game that forms the narrative structure of all Bond novels. Women are there, like children, to be rescued from the consequences of their decisions, which range from extreme personal endangerment to lesbianism. Bond is, of course, always what women need. While this satisfies our red-blooded fantasies as readers and viewers, it is important to point out that women are possibly the only thing that makes Bond at all human. He will go to great lengths to protect women as well as seduce them, even putting the all-important mission in jeopardy. This is of course designed to appeal to both women's and men's biological instincts, but no other hero in cinema places women on such a pedestal. And so, inevitably, we might ask about Bond's racism. For a racist, Bond spends an awful lot of time buddying up with foreigners, even if some of the stereotypes are painful to watch. You probably shouldn't put You Only Live Twice on if you have friends over from Japan. Which girl do you select? I'll just settle for this little old lady here. Good choice. She's very sexy for but his attitudes are not hateful, even if they are dismissive. There is no presumption of racial superiority, but rather an ambivalence to the idea of race, as with all other ideas. So Bond is not a hater, and he's a good lover. The best, apparently. Now those are remarkably unpsychopathic traits. So is James Bond Her Majesty's pet psychopath? The answer is no. Not fully, but he's enough of a psychopath to be fun to watch from a safe distance. <laughs>